can you achieve, councillors? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this meeting. Uh, it, it's a virtual meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. It has been conducted with members and officers at various locations, communicating via audio, video, and online. There is also an opportunity for the public and press to listen to and view proceedings, uh, which is via YouTube. Before the meeting starts, I would like to invite the committee member and scrutiny manager to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are in attendance. Hilary. Thank you. Um, so the protocol regarding remote and partly remote meetings has been circulated via the members information sheet service and is available on the council's website site. Therefore, I'm going to try and reduce the amount that I say at the beginning of the meeting. And as we go on with meetings, it will get less and less. So firstly, attendance. When I call out your name, can you please just confirm that you can hear and be heard? Uh, Councillor Aspinwall. Councillor Aspinwall. Has she just dropped out? I yeah, think she has done. Yeah, yeah, she's disappeared off the list. Okay, I'll carry on with this and we'll see if she comes yep. back. Okay, Councillor Bryant. Yes. Councillor Collins. Hello. Councillor Hone. Present. Councillor Hunter. Present. Councillor Levitt. Present. Councillor Nash. Yes, present. Councillor Nguala. Present. Councillor Ruggiero Chaka. Present. Councillor Strong. Present. Councillor Tyson. Present. I see Councillor Aspin will join, rejoin us. Yeah, Councillor Aspin has rejoined us and uh, Councillor Judy Billings joining us as well. Okay. Present. Apologies, I dropped out for a moment. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, so um, we've also got um, as visitors, well, we've got the leader of the council, Martin Steers Hanscom. Present. Thank you. We've also got visitors, uh, Ian Albert, Councillor Ian Albert. Hello. Hi, <laughs> Councillor Keith Hoskins. Yeah, good evening. And Councillor Judy Billing, I believe, has just joined us. Hello, but maybe not for the whole evening. <laughs> no, that, but welcome. Uh, we've got officers, um, Anthony Roche. Hello there, yep, good evening. Joe, Duff Joe Duffercy. Hello, yep. Ian Fullstone. Good evening. And Sarah Kingsley. Good evening. I hope I haven't missed anybody. Um, thank you very much. Um, so the meeting is being live streamed on the Council's YouTube channel and re recorded via Zoom. If live streaming fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Please stay in view of the camera at all times. If for any reason the meeting is not court, an officer will notify you. The meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is court, the meeting will resume. If connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Only members present for an entire debate and consideration of an item are entitled to vote. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn for the meeting for a short period to enable connection to be re-established. Um, if the ch chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will have deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and deemed to have returned at the point of reconnection. Only member, well, I've said that, sorry. Um, please ensure your mobile phone is muted and other noise emitting devices are also muted. Please activate the mute button on your tablet or computer when you're not speaking and be mindful that others can see you. If a member wishes to speak, they should use the raise hand button located in under participants. And as you're aware, when requested to vote, the voting will be via the green tick for yes, red cross for no, and blue raise hand for abstain functions. Are there any questions before we start? In that case, I'll hand over to Councillor Levitt, the chair. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody, again. Uh, apologies for absences. Item one, I have I just have uh, Councillor Jim McNally on that one, and everybody else is present at the moment. Um, notification of any other business? There is none. 
Uh, Chairman's announcements in accordance with council policy. This meeting has been audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording by the NHDC YouTube channel. Members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. The detailed reminder about this and speaking right is set out at Chair's announcement on the agenda. Item four, public participation, we have none. Uh, item five, urgent general exceptions items. I agreed as chair over the end scrutiny that an urgent report regarding ledger recovery following COVID-19 could be considered by cabinet. Uh, we also have a presentation later on um, about the council's plan for recovery from uh, Mr. Roach. Um, item six, called in items we have none. Item seven, presentation by the leader of the council. Uh, Martin Steers Hanscom, if you'd like to take a little presentation, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm now going to try to share the screen, and we did try before the uh, meeting, so all being well, I will put some things up on the screen, and I trust everyone can see that. Um, so, um, Chair, what I want to do this evening is to do four things. First of all, reflect on what we've achieved over the past year. Secondly, think about our priorities going forward. And thirdly, report on our response to COVID-19. And then finally, to answer questions. So, yes. Um, looking at, at the year just gone uh, and picking out some highlights. First of all, we set out to be a more welcoming, inclusive council. And I think we've shown that a joint administration of two parties can work run the council effectively and include all members in our policy making wherever possible. For example, last year we had a, a, a workshop of all members for the council plan. And again, this is something I'll come back to that uh, when we look forward that we'll do again this year. And um, we've built a positive relationship between cabin, cabinet and overview and scrutiny, which uh, no doubt you've asked me about, but I think that's, that's something that we, we have done. And we've certainly welcomed the Chair of Overview and Scrutiny and also of the Fire Committee to contribute to Cabinet discussions. Uh, and I know that um, uh, it works in reverse where um, Cabinet members are uh, able to um, speak at Overview and Scrutiny. Indeed, um, we've now changed the, the arrangement so that um, Cabinet members now present the reports in their area to Overview and Scrutiny and other cabinet members are here this evening uh, indicating the, uh, the uh, uh, view that we have of overview and scrutiny that it's an important critical friend that supports the work of the administration. I have to say I've been very fortunate to lead a very effective team um, and I'm proud of the way the executive members and deputies have worked together and worked with their directors and managers. And I would also say that uh, we've built a very positive partnership with the senior management team, with other staff, balancing inclusive political leadership with respecting and valuing officers' advice and expertise. And I have to say that goes with the grain because the cooperative values we have introduced in declaring the council a cooperative council chime very much with the staff organisational values introduced over the last two or three years. Uh, going on to, to uh, some of the different areas, I think one of the most important things um, in, in terms of the last year is the way we have turned around the performance on recycling and waste. And I have to thank um, both cabinet members and officers for the huge amount of work they've done in, in achieving this. Um, in various ways, that is. Uh, first of all, we've maintained the service to flats uh, as the proposed change would have not have, been, not have helped our residents. But also, of course, as we come um, to, to the time of the pandemic, it was vitally important. And again, there was a huge amount of work to done to guide the service through the pandemic. And uh, going on to um, other areas, I think another notable um, achievement over the year was the way that uh, we've extended our reach in community engagement. Um, town talks and uh, community surgeries have, uh, have uh, uh, have expanded and um, indeed uh, with the lockdown we've made sure that they continue on Zoom um, and uh, we continue to work to make sure that they're effective. 
work with young people has been quite quite something. The fledgling youth councils come forward, and uh, there was a democracy day, and certainly work with young people is a priority going forward. Um, what's been very notable is the way the community engagement team have developed their community networking and work in social media. And uh, that's shown itself during the pandemic with the way um, the volunteering has grown, the work, work with community groups has been developed. And I think that's a huge uh, achievement of, of that team uh, and for the council. We've continued our work against modern slavery and around domestic abuse and safeguarding. It was good to see that SADA, that was Stevenage against domestic abuse, is now Survivors Against Domestic Abuse, covers North Arts and is covering other districts as well. And as I've already mentioned, uh, we've responded to the lockdown with the use of video conferencing. Another very important area is the uh, climate emergency that we, we declared on day one uh, uh, of this administration. And we've taken that seriously, um, being keen to engage with uh, the community in various ways, in particular through the cabinet panel uh, for the environment. And we've made good progress drawing ideas from the community. And later this week, the climate change implementation group will meet to take some of those ideas forward. And I could go on and the different areas of the, uh, uh, of the council that, uh, um, that uh, have been very effective, but um, that, you, no doubt people may want to bring some of those up in questions. But uh, of course, what none of us expected was the, uh, the pandemic. And so events happen, as somebody once said. And uh, so I, the, the way that um, we've stepped up to the needs of the pandemic, I think has been magnificent. We've maintained our services uh, and we've responded, and I'll come back to that in, in a later slide, but. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to uh, thank, give a huge thank you to all our officers and staff to the way they've stepped up. And, and I was very pleased last week to attend the staff briefing to thank them personally, and also on your behalf, of course, thank our outgoing chief executive, David Stoles, before he leaves us. As that was a Zoom meeting, we've invited David to return at some time during the autumn so that we can have an in-person thank you by councillors and staff. And of course, that also means that uh, later this week, our Deputy Chief Executive, Anthony, will become our Managing Director, and he will be speaking later in this, uh, in this uh, meeting. So looking forward, um, of course, we will be taking forward the same priorities um, that we've been looking at uh, this year, but uh, with right at the top, the uh, importance of continuing our flexible response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As, as you've already mentioned, Chair, that will be the object of a later item on the agenda. Uh, then we'll be reviewing the council plan and financial strategy. Um, and I've already mentioned that uh, we, the uh, uh, all member uh, uh, group workshop for the, um, for the council plan. And you should have all received together with all members of the council, uh, an email to uh, fix a date. Uh, the date will be either the 10th, 11th or 12th of August. Apologies that it's in August, but uh, this is a rather unusual year, but uh, we're also very keen for anyone who can't make that date to be able to give their comments by email and the draft will be out early enough for you to do that. Then uh, we're taking action, um, taking forward the, sorry, taking forward the peer challenge action plan. And that was presented to your committee um, at its last meeting. And uh, at your next item, you'll be looking at some of the actions that follow from that, that relate to overview and scrutiny. And uh, one of the things that we were told is the recommendations of the peer challenge was to be brave. And uh, some of that will be picked up in the transformation plan where we talk about looking at a customer focus, talking about modal shift. And just to unpack that, of course, what, what that will mean is that uh, where the technology means we can do things differently, that's very important that we pick that up, be more efficient, but uh, also means that we need to look after those people who are unable to use some of those new technologies, those who are more vulnerable, hard to reach, and it will be a priority to make sure as we transform, we continue to 
uh, take uh, an interest in those people, make sure they can um, get in touch with us. It'll be very important that we work with our partners. I've mentioned a few of them there. We could have mentioned the Minority Ethnic Forum, and of course there are, there are many others. Um, and obviously I can comment on that later. Uh, of course, the um, pandemic gives us an opportunity to build back better with very much a green focus, uh, which is a lot of what we will be um, focusing on as we look at the uh, work from the climate, climate change panel. Um, and then we will be listening to our um, black and minority ethnic staff so that we respond appropriately to Black Lives Matter. It's in our DNA to be inclusive, and that's part of one of the, the central items of our, our priorities. But this is an opportunity to listen well and respond appropriately. And of course, we want to get our local plan through, and we, we now have the possibility of the, the last examinations in public to be held online. And that's something we want to pick up um, with open arms, if that's something we, we will be able to do. Now, um, one of the things I've been focusing on over the last year and taking a lot of time is working with other districts and boroughs as we look to strategic planning in, in, uh, as we go forward in the period after the, the, the local plan. So that's from 2031 onwards, because a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the uh, more interesting ways in which we can improve our district take a long time to get through, for example, uh, instead of expanding our towns, looking at a new settlement properly planned. Um, but that work has to be done. We have to work with our um, other districts and boroughs. Um, but what we have to be very careful of, and I'm happy to answer a question on this, we have to be very careful to maintain the rights of our residents in North Hearts to keep control of what is built in North Hearts. And there are things on the horizon that might be put on us by government that may put that at risk. I'll say no more than that, but I'm happy to answer a question on that. In particular, we are looking um, at um, strategic planning in the northern half of Hertfordshire, in, in the corridor that we're in, um, which um, loosely go goes along the, the, um, the A505 and the A507. But we're not just talking about roads, we're talking about data infrastructure. Um, we're talking about, as I say, possible new settlements. We're talking about um, the, the way in which our town centres can be re regenerated and the plans that we have for them. And then I've mentioned at the end that there are two cabinet panels we want to um, kick off. The first one, probably in September, um, on community engagement and cooperative development. There are a number of ideas in that area that I know um, Judy and Keith are very keen to get their teeth into and uh, then later on probably um, in, in uh, later autumn the housing and strategic planning um, panel. Then I said um, moving on to the final area that um, with the pandemic we've had to up our game and instead of meeting less regularly every week the leaders of the districts and boroughs together with the leader of the county council have been meeting We've been cooperating in Operation Shield and Sustain. We all know about the massive volunteer effort that uh, has been uh, led by the Council of Voluntary Service with Team, Team Hearts and the help that we've given to vulnerable people through Hearts Help. Uh, now, that's been something that where we've been working with governments, the government asked us to do what it takes and initially said they will pay what it takes. We responded but it's become very clear that the government will leave us short financially, and that's something we'll have to grapple with. But on the other hand, the surveys by the Local Government Association show that our residents and residents around the country value the responses that councils have made. And that has put um, ourselves in a, in a very strong position with our residents in terms of the work that we do. Now we know that the next stage, opening up, working on track and trace, picking up the pieces, that's going to be difficult. Um, you know there's been an announcement today when we can open our um, leisure centres and other areas and that's something we're very pleased about um, and uh, we look forward to working with our um, local community both economically and keeping them safe. 
Uh, we're, we've got to be preparing for any local outbreaks, but uh, of course, government mixed messages don't help. There's that balance between opening up and keeping safe. And then I'll move on to my final slide, Chair. This is the, the thing that we've taken responsibility for. The, um, there is a local outbreak plan board, which I am one of the, the members with the other district and borough leaders and uh, county leader, um, and also the, uh, the, the um, police and crime commissioner. Um, th there's an officers board to go, go along with it. Um, it's led by Jim McManus, the director of public health. And like every other area, we've been had great difficulty getting full data. Um, that's one of the difficulties I mentioned earlier, but uh, uh, I've put down there the latest data that we have for North Hearts. And you can see that uh, we've had um, 236 cases of, sorry, I've been to this, never mind. Um, 236 um, COVID-19 cases directly related um, as against 4,000 cases in Hearts as a whole. And the number per 10,000 gives you an idea that actually we've not fared as badly as some areas in, in Hertfordshire. And indeed, some of the districts in the south of the county have had much worse time than we have. Um, of course, every death is a tragedy to, to that person and their relations. And there have been 96 directly COVID-19 related deaths um, as against a thousand in the county as a whole. Of those 51 were in hospital, 41, 40 in care homes and five in the community. But that's those we know directly related to COVID-19. And the figure for excess deaths, th those are our provisional figures, I have to say. The figure for excess deaths is much higher. And that's the greater number of deaths than there, there have been that wouldn't have been in a, in a similar period in a previous year. And that the latest figures I've seen on that is something like 400 in North Hearts. So we don't know where, what that was about, but it does give us an idea of what it's done to us already and how we need to be prepared for um, the future, for any new spike, for any local outbreak. Uh, we've had to give a register of high, the high risk settings the places, houses in multiple occupation, um, uh, factories, food processing places, things like that. And we will have to play our part in contact tracing. If there is a local outbreak, whether it's in one particular setting, whether it's in a town, whether it's in the whole district, we'll have to be prepared. And um, as we found in Leicester, um, it's not necessarily going to be that easy, but we're up for the, up for the job and working together with our colleagues around the county, we will um, play out, do our best in that. And uh, I'm told to keep my phone by the bed, just in case so we get a notice, very short notice to, uh, to, to be part of that. So with that, uh, Chair, questions? Thank you, thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I've got Sue, um, asking a question. I've got a couple as well, but Sue, if you want to ask yours first. Thank you, David. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about Black Lives Matters. Um, and it's fantastic that it's on our agenda. I'm really pleased to see that and that we'll be consulting um, our BAME staff to, um, to respond appropriately. I wondered if you could elaborate on that a little bit, Martin, and tell us a bit more about it. And in particular, will we be consulting more widely? One of my um, key concerns is structural racism within institutions. And I wondered how we specifically would be looking at that in terms of our council structure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, shall I come back on that one straight away, David? Yep. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, Sue. In, in terms of the way we're consulting staff, we, with our Shaping the Future um, agenda, which is the way we, our transformation of, of, of looking to work transform the, the, the way we work as, as, as a council among our staff, we have a um, group that is taking that forward and we are including um, black and minority ethnic staff on that group. It's something we're doing anyway, um, and, but it's something, it's an opportunity, as I say, to um, uh, listen to their experience and um, pick up anything uh, uh, around that. 
in terms of wider consultation, one of the things we do anyway is ensure that when we recruit staff, um, until you get to actual interview, there is no way of working out from somebody's name or anything else like that, what, what their ethnic background is. So uh, we get our shortlist on a totally, um, uh, I was gonna say blind, but I don't know if that's the right word, um, way of, it, of in, ensuring that uh, we give an equal chance to all our staff, or all, all our potential staff uh, as we do the, um, as we recruit. Um, in terms of the wider community, obviously, as we engage, um, one of our priorities has been and will continue to be in, in ensuring that we reach all groups and therefore um, black and minority ethnic groups are important in that. And I'm very pleased I attended the AGM of the Minority Ethnic Forum last year. We've uh, invited them to speak to councillors and uh, obviously for many years now we've been consulting them in the way we, we, we look at things. So uh, hopefully that gives you a, a fairly broad um, aspect of the, of the way we're treating that. Thank you. Okay, with okay, that one, Sue? Yes, I just hope that councillors will be involved in the consultation as well. Thank you. Uh, Terry. Yeah, thank you, Chef. Yes, Martin, thank you for that presentation. Uh, a few poses, if I can. Um, let me deal with uh, maintained services. Um, not particularly, we didn't maintain services. In fact, we pulled brown bins and food collection, didn't we, pretty early on, unlike seven other authorities in Hertfordshire who continued to do it. So we didn't maintain those services. So struggling a bit with that and also waste improvement. I don't see anything, I haven't seen anything that says that our recycling rates have improved in the past 12 months. Um, perhaps I'm missing something, but as you can imagine, I do see a lot of data that comes out around uh, recycling by districts, boroughs, et cetera, et cetera. So I personally didn't, have not seen anything that said that North Hearts has improved from its 52%, but uh, I, I will only too pleased to stay corrected on that. Um, also maintain services. Uh, I try to say that to my residents who are knocking on my door saying I want to swim in the outdoor pool. Uh, many other authorities are swimming in their outdoor pools, uh, having uh, spent the past 11 weeks getting ready for it, knowing sooner or later it was going to have to happen. Um, sad that we can't. Yes, indoor pools, great. Um, and the, uh, I'm glad we can do that and the government's going to bring light. But some people do like swimming their outdoor pools and let's say we've had a fair old time to look at that. So that service has uh, not been maintained. Um, when you said on your slide four, working with partners and working with growth board, I noticed a significant gap in the, the list there. Um, let me remind you that uh, working with the partners, your biggest partner probably is Hearts County Council. And the growth board, of course, is led, um, and very much so, not chair, but led by Hearts County Council. So I hope that there is just a, an omission because you have a list there rather than the fact that you're saying Hearts County Council are a non-important player in this, uh, in both the growth board and also in the work that you're doing around uh, uh, working with partners, because certainly we like to think we're working with partners. And I'd like to know if we're not, and please make me aware if we're not working with, uh, if North Hearts District Council is not working with HCC, or particularly if HCC are not working with NHDC. That I'd be very interested in to jump up and down on somebody at a different place. So one final thing is, didn't mention a famous place in Hitchin, which was raved about the past five years by certain people, about the past 10 years by certain people, which I thought we would make progress on. I think it's called Churchgate. I didn't see anything on there that said we made any progress whatsoever around Churchgate. I assume some has been made, but I know it was a big, uh, a big ask and a big thing that we wanted to do. And certainly, I know, Martin, you're keen to do it and other councils are keen to make something happen there. I've not seen much progress. Perhaps I'm missing out on it, but uh, interested to know if we are making progress on that. I think uh, uh, I've asked enough by now, uh, Chairman, so I'll leave it to the cable, uh, cable hands of the leader of the council. Thank you, Terry. Uh, Martin, do you want to come back on some of those points? I, I counted seven questions there, so yeah. I will try to do them justice. Um, in terms of maintaining services, yes, Terry, we uh, we would have loved to have kept going all on the food and the um, the, the garden waste. We uh, that some of the councils were able to do that, some of us weren't. We've worked hard to um, to ensure that we did what we could. Uh, we uh, you, you know the details, and I know how hard Vaughan and his staff and Elizabeth and um, Carol worked to to do what we could there, but we. 
it was safety first. We had to make sure that our staff was safe and we do take our staff seriously as well as uh, the, the services. So I, I think we did what we could and also we've made sure that we've um, given a recompense to our residents who lost the, uh, the, the, the waste service. So um, that, that was question number one. Um, improving um, recycling. Well, one of the problems, you know, uh, Terry, of, of going paperless is that uh, the volumes of paper have gone down. So the amount of recycling there is a problem. And of, of course, also the, the money we get for, for paper has lessened. Um, now, um, what was your next? Oh, um, if I've not missed one, the next one was on outdoor pools. Um, there's a very interesting article in The Guardian and on the BBC about the problem with um, the, the pools. And it's wonderful when the government says on one day, you can open your pools tomorrow and doesn't give councils any notice. But at the same time, issues guidance that uh, things that we can't do. And that's happened on several things. As far as pools are concerned, uh, we were working very hard to see whether we could open the outdoor pools at all. We reached a stage where the time it would take to open them and the, uh, the season that would be left, we would talk about a month to open them, as in you'll see in that article on the BBC, many, many around the country are finding. It, we'd have opened in the middle of August for about three weeks before then we closed down because we always closed down at the end of August. That would be a nonsense and you would be right on top of us for wasting um, council taxpayers' money if we did that because we'd have to take on extra staff and so on. What we have done, as I mentioned, we can announce today, and you've seen the email, that our out indoor pools are open um, in the, uh, by, on the 25th, that the splash parks are gonna be open. We've kept that balance between safety and um, opening so that we do our best for our residents. Um, County Council, yes, that was a li the list I gave was a list of um, the, uh, of examples, it wasn't the only one. Um, the Growth Board, yes, um, is working with the County Council, as I said in my, what I said, we're working with the County Council and with the other districts and boroughs um, on, on, in the Growth Board. Um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe somebody else will ask me a question on where the Growth Board's going, but that's a different question. Um, I should have also mentioned, I could have, as I said, I could have mentioned a number of other areas. I should have mentioned the, the Town Hall and Museum and the way the museum has gone on during the, the, the lockdown and so on. But you mentioned church gates. It would be delightful to, to be able to move forward on that. Um, one of the, the, the things around that is that, of course, with the, uh, with the pandemic, that makes it more difficult to go forward. But it's on our agenda. There are talks um, and discussions um, and looking at different options all the time. It's one that we would like to, to, to do. But, um, I got on the council back in um, 1979, and I think we were probably talking about it then. It's certainly been around for a very long time. So I can say you've had 20 years, we've had a year. We're making progress as much as you are. So um, we're, we're all working on that one. Thank you, Martin. Um, Tony. You're on mute. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I think Councillor Holmes asked two of the questions I wanted to ask, but um, Martin actually mentioned about working with the growth board and the district and boroughs working together. Obviously, we've got one uh, instance whereby the waste contract working with East Hearts has uh, obviously saved the council a great deal of money, uh, even though it got off to a rocky start. I wonder what areas were being considered and looked at of other ways that we could work together at the moment. Right. The growth board has been specifically about um, a planning, a, a strategic planning in the period after 2031. And uh, I'm working on um, the, uh, the, the, the potential um, projects, the infrastructure and so on with, with regard to that. Other working on other services, of course, we, we do share um, on building control with, with other authorities. Um, we're always looking for other possibilities of of working together. Um, and um, I have to say, working with East Hearts, 
some of the, the potential in the uh, um, Northeast and Central Hearts um, uh, strategic planning group, um, a number of the initiatives there look very exciting. And we're, this, there is a, a uh, All Hertfordshire Sustainability Board that's looking at um, the climate emergency that we've all declared and we're, we're working together on that. So uh, we're always looking for other opportunities. Um, we'll keep you in touch, but uh, the, the priority at the moment obviously is with the pandemic. So I don't see any early um, wins on, on, that, um, on that score. Thank you, Martin. Um, I've got no other hands up at the moment, but I've got a couple of points I want to pick up on. The first one was uh, say thank you to all the cabinet members who do attend these overview and scrutiny committees. Um, it's, it's good as well now that it's much easier using these virtual meetings to actually go to them. Um, I've actually watched a few on Zoom, on um, uh, YouTube as well, a couple of the meetings as well, which is a different experience, shall we say, to, to being here live on the meetings. Um, so yes, thank you for, for the cabinet members who do come along to these meetings now. Um, the modal shift, as you say, we must be really careful not to be exclusive to those people who, who can't use net technology or indeed those who won't use, use new technology. I had a long conversation with somebody about that very subject today. Um, growth board. As you know, Martin, I was, I've been involved in that from its very early stages and when it sort of had its roots in HIP and moved from there and moved onwards. And one of the things that's always been a sticking point has been the individual authorities uh, maintaining control over their own assets um, and not having huge amounts of money and stuff going to a central pot and then get spent in Watford or somewhere else. And, uh, North Heart sees no benefit from it. Uh, and that's always been a bit of a sticking point. Uh, and one, I've insisted that we, we do maintain our control of our own assets. Um, and we, we, at the early stages, we had a veto vote in there that if any particular authority didn't agree with anything, they could have the sort of uh, veto as, as in the European Union used to do. Um, it, it, so my questions on that is, is this still a part of the thinking on the growth board? And the other part of it, were, which was one of the main discussion points, was would it be a whole Hertfordshire, if you're looking at going towards unitary or joint working, would it be a whole Hertfordshire or a north-south split or, or something like that? I've got some questions on the COVID as well, but I'll come back on those. Okay, um, first point on the growth board. Um, my view in being a member of the growth board was to maintain the right of, uh, certainly, and you put it, you call it a veto, the right of veto on anything happening in North Hearts must remain with North Hearts. And that has been the, the, the way we've done it up until about two meetings ago. Then we've been talking to government about the, uh, what we want in order to prepare for 2031 onwards. And there has been a move towards majority voting. In, and uh, you take the European Union as an example, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mm. Uh, move towards majority voting, then towards a statutory committee, uh, then possibly towards a, uh, a, a joint or combined authority with or without a mayor as possibilities. It seems to be a slippery slope. And um, my, if I can put my point of view on this, um, and you mentioned unitary authorities, um, that there is going to be a government white paper on devolution, which unitaries will be very much at the centre of it. What I would say, I was, uh, it, it's, North Hearts has been very, very important to me in terms of maintaining um, the con that such control as we have. I was around, it, I came to North Hearts in 1974, um, which was the year that North Hearts started. Um, it built up, it's worked to represent and become an authority which looks, looks after all its four towns and 33 parishes and tries to keep a balance and does it well and ensures that we protect our, um, our, our, our residents. I would see, I would be very, very loath to lose that ability to control what happens to us, whether it goes to 
a unitary authority of all of Hertfordshire or one of parts of Hertfordshire. Perhaps parts of Hertfordshire might be uh, not as bad, but I would work very hard to maintain the, uh, particularly at this time, we should be focusing on the uh, recovery. We've, all our offices have worked, as I've mentioned before, have worked so hard to ensure that we maintain our, the, the safety of our residents and going forward, they will continue to do that. And that's our priority. It will be a massive diversion if we go into local government reorganization. And anyone who's got any influence on both county council and government who can say, don't go in that direction. Let's maintain what we're doing, help our people to recover, look forward to lo local outbreaks, and as I've mentioned before, but whatever we do, maintain the, the right of our residents to have control over what is built in our district. Thank, thank you for that. Um, it, it is an important thing that we keep an eye on uh, with what's happening with the growth board. Um, and overview and scrutiny was in a peer review was was asked to look at the longer term things on something. I think this is a particular thing that we need to keep an eye on at overview and scrutiny as, as to where the growth board's going, because it is going to affect the whole way this council operates in the future. Um, so we, if we can keep regular updates on that, I'd be really grateful for that, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, going back to the pandemic COVID um, stuff on there, the figures you showed per 10,000, uh, how, how do they relate to the national mean? Are, are we below the national mean long way or round about on it? Uh, I'd have to have notice of that. I, I know um, Hertfordshire as a whole is, uh, and just going back to my slide, Hertfordshire as a whole is not the worst. And in many ways, there are certainly the cities have, have hit it worse. Mm. So Hertfordshire probably in the middle. The, the districts, uh, and I, I can give you a written answer. I, I, I can seek further information on that yeah, um, and give a written answer to members of the committee. But uh, uh, my impression on, on the calls we've had with Jim McManus is that uh, Hertfordshire has done um, about in the middle. There's some areas that have hardly had any um, uh, of the the, um, the deaths and, and the cases, um, and there are the big cities have hit it worst. And in Hertfordshire, as I say, the southern districts of, of um, particularly Hartsmere and Watford have had the largest number of cases and deaths. Um, and the, the North Hearts and East Hearts have come off, uh, and Stevenage uh, have come off not as bad. Um, but uh, I, I can give a fuller answer if you'd like. Yeah, thank you. I'd be, be interested in that. Um, the last bit on that one is contract tra contact tracing. You were mentioning about local outbreak response and how it's becoming more important. And, uh, and a, a key part of that is the track and trace and the contact tracing. Yeah. How is that checked on that it's actually being done? Because I know when they talked about reopening the pubs and people going into pubs, you would, one of the points there was you had to give your name and address as you went in there. Um, well, that's what I understood from the legislation. However, having been into two pubs in Letcher within the last week and neither of them took any details whatsoever of anybody who went in there, um, how, how is that contract tracing enforced or can it be enforced? I have to say, and I said mixed messages and uh, picking up the pieces, I think um, we don't know. Um, the, our environmental health officers are working with um, the team at County in order to follow up what the government is asking us to do, but the uh, rules are not clear. And that's something, that's questions that we've asked. We, we're trying to uh, ensure that we're ready for anything that does happen locally. But I think anyone who's looked at um, Peter Soulsby at, at Leicester and, and the, the way they're tearing their hair out, and what worries me, um, particularly given the answers that uh, Boris has given in, in Parliament um, when there's a particular problem. It tends to be blame the people who are, who are doing their best to help, as with the care workers. Uh, and I, I worry that um, clearly Leicester was blamed for uh, the fact that they weren't given the information they needed. I just hope we're in a better position if we'd have an outbreak in Hertfordshire. I can't say I'm confident that we will be. 
And I know Jim McManus has done a superb job to do what he can, but there are still huge gaps. And that's the honest truth. Okay, thank you for that. Claire. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, uh, Councillor Holmes actually raised um, one of the things I wanted to uh, talk about, which was the outdoor pools and the fact that, that there had been no sort of primary work actually looking at how the outdoor pools and actually preparing them so that they could have opened as soon as there was a, a sort of green light given to that. And although you said, you know, about the time scale and the time that the pools are open, I think there's a missed opportunity because the pools could have stayed open for a bit longer. We've certainly over the last few years in this country enjoyed more um, sort of longer summers and warmth in sort of well into the sort of September, almost into early October. So rather than closing early in that September, they could have perhaps stayed open for a bit longer so that the people in North Hearts could have enjoyed them. So I think there's a missed opportunity there. Um, the other thing that I'm kind of concerned about is I, I note that, you know, there's now been press releases saying that the leisure centres are going to be opening, but yet there's for, an, and I declare an interest, I am a member of, of um, the Hitchin um, Archers Gym. And I think a lot of people have concerns of exactly what measures are going to be put in place to keep the those that use that gym it safe um, going forward. Now, one thing that I was very pleased about was that uh, Councillor Hoskins invited me along to go around the North Hearts Museum so that we that we together um, and along with I've forgotten her name. Anyway, sorry, Councillor Helen Oliver was also there. So he could walk around and actually appreciate prior to the opening what the, what the new measures were being careful and, and again, have a look at that. But obviously as a councillor, I have seen absolutely nothing on how we're going to be protecting our residents when the leisure centres are going to be opened. I say, I do declare an interest because I, I'm concerned about myself in going into any areas where there are, I'm meeting large numbers of people um, and the potential risk to myself and to my health and the reason for that is I was quite seriously ill in March April time and I'm very very wary of um, mm. contracting Covid until I know that my immune system is clearly rebuilt. Okay taking those in turn the first one on, on missed, up, missed opportunity for opening pools we were, had no warning that the government were going to say you could open pools on that, on that occasion. Um, our staff, the, obviously they're not our staff, they're our they're staff from um, the uh, from Stevenage Leisure Limited, they were furloughed. Um, to bring them back it cost money; it's extra cost. And it could have been the case that we were back into August, and we still couldn't open our outdoor pools. Um, in terms of the the the, the measures, I know, as you say, whatever we're doing, we we are um, taking the relevant measures. I, I I see Anthony's lit up his uh, screen, so I think that's an indication that. Anthony might help me on that one. So um, can I pass over to, to Mr. Roach? Yes, thank you. Um, I think I'm a co-host for the meeting, which means I can't raise my hand. So um, just on the outdoor pools and why we weren't able to prep them in advance, um, as Councillor Steers Hanscom uh, rightly said, it takes approximately four weeks to uh, clean the pools, get the chemical balance right, heat them up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before they're able to be used. Um, it, those setup costs cost at least £12,000 per pool, and then it costs about £2,000 per day to operate the pools. So if we had kept them, uh, if we'd prepared them early and say had kept them standing for a month, you'd be looking at approximately £75,000 per pool. Um, and that's why we weren't able to have them essentially prepped and ready to go. Um, we have kept the situation under review um, and sort of looked at when it would be realistic to be able to reopen them. But with one day's notice from government for something that takes four weeks to prepare, when the season ends, um, take the point that we could have potentially have extended the season. But even if we extended it, say, to the end of September, you're entirely weather dependent as to uh, what the usage would be and um, we wouldn't have been able to come close to recouping those costs. Uh, last year, Letchworth Outdoor Pool cost us approximately £2.50 per swimmer, um, per, per swimming session, per swimmer, um, in, by way of subsidy. So if you look at that sort of a figure, 
and that was with a full season. So with a reduced season and less ability to get your uh, upfront investment back, it just wasn't a decision we were able to take. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Anthony, for that. That helps. Tony, on the you... second, sorry, on the second question, Claire raised um, in, in terms of what measures are being taken to keep people safe. Um, I think we. Um, I'll get a, a, a written answer to you. I think that's probably the best way to do that, rather than to unless Anthony's going to say something additionally here. Um, there will be a public announcement later this week. Uh, we wanted to get the announcement out today about the reopenings. There is more detail to follow, uh, which will come out later this week, and that will set out clearly um, what protections are being put into place and, and what um, the customers need to do. So w watch this space on that one for the detail. Yeah. Thanks, Anthony. Tony. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, just on that, come back to Anthony. So when you say there's going to be an announcement, is that going to be to the public or is that going to be to councillors for us to get a sort of a forewarned of what's happening? Um, the comms manager is on the call. Um, it, what I was referring to was in terms of public, but certainly we can provide that in advance to councillors to help you answer any queries. I think it would be useful to actually to hear it from the council um, officers to councillors first before I read it in the post and then get, get questions being asked. Um, I'm, at the moment, I seem to be reading an awful lot in the press and then hearing about it afterwards. And as much as it's always nice to get information, I think there's always been in past years a sort of protocol about letting councillors know first from every party. And the um, today's announcement was sent to all councillors in advance of it being announced to the public. So we'll make sure that happens later this week when the, those details come out. Well, okay. with respect, Thanks. Thanks. you're actually all within your council email, um, which I'm not um, every hour, every day. It might go to councillors and then it comes out, you know, an hour or so later into the press. When I'm talking about giving advance warning to councillors, I'm talking more, more of a few hours, please. Great. Thank you for that one. It's been noted. Tony. Thank you, Chairman. I, mean, I understand where Councillor Strong is coming from because whether it be play parks or splash parks or leisure centres, a lot of that information actually um, happened before we were aware of it. But the point I wanted to make um, to the leader was that, uh, and you mentioned um, earlier about YouTube, is that I've had a number of complaints about YouTube in the sense that people can watch a stream and talk but when they go to the papers, they lose the image. And I thought initially I was told that um, residents would be able to watch both. So I wanted to make the leader aware. Sorry, I, I don't, I'm not sure I picked up what you were, what you were saying, Tony. You, you're saying that uh, when you watch on YouTube, you can't see things that are shared? No, um, you can watch on YouTube and see us now talking to each other, etc and also the gallery view but when you go to the actual papers to actually view the documents you lose the image and i've had a number of residents say it would be pleasant to be able to read the documents and still have a gallery view and initially i was told that both would be available at the same time and i've had a number of complaints that they can't view the documents and see the images at the same time well, we have uh, Mark from IT with us this evening, so no doubt he's picked up that that point, and maybe we can look into that. Um, uh, I, I, I've raised the point myself with IT and committee service as well about that. It, it's an issue with the links, the way the links work, and I think that's been IT are looking into resolving that issue with the links, the way the links work. Sam, I, can, can I just come back before I go on to Sam, um, Chair, if I point. may? On, 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 on the um, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think just, just to point this out, um, I'm I currently have the YouTube open and my papers and Zoom all on the same screen. All you do is open it in a new window and it works fine. Yeah, so there isn't yeah. actually a problem. I think it's more you, you just maybe we need to add a note just saying right click and open a new window. There isn't an issue with opening yeah. the papers and watching okay. YouTube at the same time. Yeah. Doing it right now. We, we picked that up some, but for, for a lot of people who, who, who are not afraid with right clicking and diff, different things, it's not the, it, it, yeah. you, you automatically click on the thing. If somebody says something about the papers, you click on the link and then it push, it's gone. Um, 
but it, it is, it's, as you say, it's just a case of sorting the links, but I believe that is being done by IT and we'll follow up on that one. Okay, can I just Chair, come back on, on um, Claire's point about having um, more than three hours notice on something. The difficulty we have at the moment is that we are trying as hard as we can to get things out to the public. So sometimes it, in a, a situation like this, when the government gives us a day's notice, there's no way we can give you two days notice because that would be before we actually know what the government wants us to do. So we're in that sort of situation. So I'd ask you to bear with us on that. I, I, I agree with Claire's general point that uh, we should get notice out to, to members well before we get things out to the public. But if we're up against those sort of deadlines, then um, it's not necessarily possible. And have a word with your friends in, uh, in number 10, etc. Okay, Claire, very, very last point. Just make it quick, please, because we're going to move on now. Yeah, just to come back, I'm sure there's a tremendous amount of work that Stevenage Le Ledger are looking at on how to make that Ledger Centre safe. So um, I, I heard what you said, Councillor Hysteus Henskin, but I do think that, you know, whatever they're thinking, as our museum staff showed, they put a lot of thought into it. They were able to take myself, uh, Councillor Helen Oliver and Councillor Keith Hoskins around and, and show us exactly what they were doing before they opened their, their faci facility and they've been working very hard on it and we were able to make comment. So I would hope that the leisure centres are already doing all the work that's needed. I'm sure they are because up and down the country every single business started to think about what their, the impact of Covid was going to be on their business when they reopened that business. So I hope they're not going to be leaving it all to the last minute and that we're only going to be here in you know, minutes before the public. I'm sure they know already what they've done and any protective equipment and anything that they will need will have been ordered and it will be being installed. I'll, uh, I'll see if I can get you an invite to go around the leisure centre as well, as you did with that the... One, uh, I would be delighted members. to accept. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Martin, for that. Uh, quite a long session there for you, but thank you for all that information. Um, okay. Moving on now to item eight, uh, resolutions of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Hilary, if you could run us through that one, please. Certainly, Chair. Um, I'm not going to say very much on this. Um, as you can see, uh, based on the meeting last, uh, the last meeting, we've taken an awful lot off of the uh, resolutions, which were marked as complete or where they were duplicated. Um, so the main two issues I'm going to talk about are the waste task and finish group, which at the last meeting we discussed that the effects and impacts of COVID-19 on all services had resulted in a delay uh, and the, in the ability for officers to draw up the um, scope and organise this. And it's very likely that this won't take place until we are a little bit back to business as normal, not whatever that normal is. Um, we also need to put a lot of thought into, as we discussed at the last meeting, how we engage successfully. And you've talked about engaging with people who aren't familiar with things like Zoom or very good at IT. So how we engage with those people as well. So we need to put a lot of thought into that um, before we plow ahead. And we, I think we need to do this successfully rather than quickly. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention on the resolutions is the uh, local plan. So on page seven, um, it's mentioned about the local plan. And I think uh, Councillor Steers Hanscom mentioned that there was a, a possibility now that some of the uh, examinations that were due to happen in March and got cancelled due to COVID may well take place um, remotely. Um, we're just waiting to hear from that. Uh, whether that's definitely going to go ahead, but I'm happy to take any questions. And just an update on that, the local plan project board is due to meet later this week as well, where they'll, they'll be updated on that as well, and whatever's happening with that. Uh, Claire? Yes, just sorry, but a question on this. Again, going back to um, the resolutions of the overview and scrutiny group and what's written in the papers for these task and finish groups, does that mean that other items cannot be looked into and they're only specifically going to look into them at those points? Sorry, I'm not with you. Do you mean that we can't have any task and finish group? I think we're no, going no, to struggle. No. Sorry. The res there's a resolution. Uh, there was resolutions made about the task and finish group for recycling and waste. Mm. Um, and there's a, there's a number of points, you know, in your, um, 
in the paper. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean then that, that, that the scope of the contract is only limited to the, those points that are in there or are they allowed to broaden it and change that? No, the, the scope will include those points, but that's not the limit of the points. So a, a very long time ago, um, when was it? Back in September 18, um, a list of points were brought up and that's the first item on the resolutions. Yeah. Um, but since then, obviously, there's lots more points to add. So a, a broader scope will be drawn up and considered by the chair of the um, task and finish group prior to it starting. Uh, and we'll include as much as we can. And we no, will... the only I'm saying on that is because the very first one, which is why the decision was made to mobilise the contract on a reasonable time scale is, and I found that very odd because the, the old contract was signed for seven years and then it was there was some renewal done on it so we knew as a council this major contract that we had we knew exactly when it was terminating and everything so I, I, I found that one kind of rather strange but anyway I'll perhaps I'll leave my comments until I and I can feed them in when we know that that task and finish group is starting. Absolutely you can. Thank um, you. Once we have a date we'll be able to appoint a chair and of course it is being dependent on when we can get that task and finish group going and with next year's elections in mind, et cetera, who will be on those task and finish groups. So we will have to be a bit, a bit careful around when we set those up and make sure that we have the continuity this time on them. Absolutely. And uh, just to clarify, Chair, at the moment, we do have the two task and finish groups and we do have the two chairs uh, in place. Um, but obviously, we need to keep an eye on, on, on um, who is available, who continues to be available. Yeah. Uh, and I, th I think what we'll do is subject to resources and I will talk to people outside this meeting about making sufficient resources available to make those happen uh, in a timely manner. And I hope that will help you as well there, Hilary. Um, so we'll take that a bit further. There's three items to remove from that resolutions list, which are the last three on there. Uh, service direct commercial about the Hitchin Town Hall closure. That has been complete, so it can be removed. Um, the inviting the local enterprise partnership and settle is now been included on the on the work program. Although we haven't got a date yet, is actually on the work program to be scheduled, so that can be removed uh, from that bit. And deputy chief executive we requested to make a presentation on the, or present a report to over the scrutiny committee regarding a recovery program. Uh, the Deputy Chief Executive Stroke Managing Director in waiting will be making that report tonight so that item can be removed as well. Uh, and that covers item eight. Item nine, uh, Overview and Security Committee Work Programme for 2021. Um, Hilary again on this one, if you want to take that. Okay, one. well, the, the only um, bit I really want to draw attention to is that I have extracted the um, actions relating to overview and scrutiny from the Corporate Peer Challenge Action Plan that was presented to uh, Cabinet uh, a little while ago. Um, so those actions are included as an appendix. Um, and I'm suggesting that it, you might like to keep an eye on these and to view them every meeting in order that you can act, it can act as an aid memoir as to what you should be considering and um, changes you should make um, and then uh, assess the effect in the effectiveness of any changes that you do actually make in accordance with the action plan so I think it's probably a good idea to maintain view of that and we can change the format so that we can have on the end a, 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 an update and a, or a completion or a, um, some additional columns to, to feed back into that. Yeah, that, that would be very helpful. For those who haven't got that's pages 21, 22, 23, 24 is, is, is those items that relate to it. Um, and I think one of the things that came out of Martin's presentation earlier on was the, the, the bit about the um, growth board. And I think that's important that we actually put that as one of the things that the um, peer challenge group were talking about was looking at things well in advance and working through them. And I think putting the uh, growth board into that work program is 
quite important now, um, as we just, as I mentioned to Martin earlier on. So if we can find a way of getting that in Hillary somewhere as a regular update, that yeah, would be okay. very helpful. The, the um, last thing, sorry, that I did forget, forget to mention is that you need to look at the forward plan to see if there's yeah. anything that you want to consider in September. I do apologise for not mentioning that. Okay, so if we can go back to the members of the committee, please, on the forward plan, um, which is pages so printed 17, 18, and 19 of your agenda pack there. Um, the two I've already picked up on are on page 19 are the care line future provision and the draft design SPD that I was, I think would like, I would like both of those to come to overview and scrutiny. If anybody's got anything else on that forward plan, I would like to see. Uh, speak now or for everyone, hold your peace. Yeah, the one that I also picked up, I'd like to see is the COVID-19 financial in, impacts update. I think again, is that something that, that would be a far um, item because it's totally financial. And it is going to cabinet on the 21st of July as well. Yeah, I mean, although, although there's financial, there's also social impacts as well. That's the only problem that which, you know, it, it's sort of on both really because different ways of working and that and how the and the council's delivering services i would have thought might have been a overview and scrutiny because it's an impact yeah, service we, 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 there we, is also... we're covering that later tonight on the recovery plan okay yeah we're covering that aspect of it later tonight um so if there's nothing else on there we have uh four recommendations the committee prior is part the Getting the right teeth in. The, the committee prioritised proposed topics for inclusion in a work programme as a text appendix A, and where appropriate, de de determines a high level form and time of, of scrutiny input. Uh, I think the one we've added in there tonight is that bit about the local enterprise, uh, about the growth board um, yes. as a regular update. Um, 2.2 2, The committee having considered a forward plan attached to appendix B suggests the list of items we considered at its meeting on 8th of September which we've done with those two items. Yeah. Uh, corporate peer, peer plan action plan as attached to be considered. And the corporate peer challenge action plan extract be appended to future work programs. Uh, I think your suggestion, Henry, about putting uh, dates and things in there as well is, is, is useful and somewhere we can tick it off. Similar to we do with the work with the, the, the recommendations where we can say completed and when. Uh, yeah, so we do in the form of the recommendations, it make it very easy to follow then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I think we better, I think we need to take a vote on those actually because they are recommendations to, to this committee. Um, so are you ready to take it, Hilary? Yes, yes. Uh, so green, yes. Red cross, no. And blue hand abstain, please. Thank you. I think that's everybody. And that's everybody. passed. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that, everybody. Moving on, uh, item 10 is the Council's plan for recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. Anthony, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, if you just bear with me whilst I share my screen. Fingers crossed this works. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yes. Um, let me just minimise the videos. There we go. Thank you. I've only had the laptop a couple of hours, so I'm still finding my way around it. Um, so uh, there's a couple of points in here which duplicate points the leader has already made in his presentation. So I will try not to duplicate too much. Worth reflecting on um, the experience that we've had as an organisation. Um, the scale and nature of the challenge has been completely unprecedented uh, beyond anything that we've had to deal with before or hopefully we'll have to deal with again. And it's obviously had a significant impact. Despite that, we have actually managed to maintain a, a really good level of service throughout the organisation. 
and I'll touch a bit more on how we've been able to do that. We need to recognise, of course, that for our communities and also for the council itself, that what we would term business as usual uh, from sort of the historic business as usual may not come back um, either in the short or medium term or possibly even ever. So just obviously setting some of the, the context um, for some of my remarks which are to follow. I think it's also worth reflecting, and I think everyone uh, at this meeting will be very familiar with the uh, sort of expressions of a second wave or maybe even a third or a fourth wave. And so that business as usual or going back to something more akin to it is unlikely to be smooth and straightforward because if there are those further outbreaks, either nationally or indeed at a local level that require further periods of lockdown, um, that will obviously interrupt with that process, it may at times require us to go back to some of the more restrictive um, approaches that uh, our communities are having, having to be um, comply with over the last three or four months. And also worth acknowledging that there are other external factors that have an impact on, um, on the recovery. Probably the biggest single one is the EU transition currently slated for the end of the year. We still don't know what that is going to look like. Uh, and clearly that could have some major implications. We are obviously aware that the pandemic has caused uh, an economic shock um, internationally and how that plays out in the short, medium and long term obviously potentially affects the recovery and what, what we need to do and what we're able to do. So if I just move on to the next slide, just bear with me a moment. There we go. So just plotting out um, what we think is the recovery route map. Three sort of stages to it. Uh, the initial emergency response, which as we've sort of indicated on here, we're beginning to move out of. I think there is then an interim response where um, we potentially have the ability to test different approaches to how we will be delivering services how our customers are able to access us um, and what may or may not work um, as solutions. So for example, members will be aware that the County Council have uh, put steps in place in relation to the town centres as interim responses to the easing of lockdown, but in order to try to uh, help people maintain social distancing. Well, that, that's the sort of thing we mean by those interim responses. And then looking into the longer term, potentially there will be permanent solutions in terms of how we live and um, how, we, how we operate as an organization going forward. So just touching on what has been the emergency response, both county-wide and then at NHDC level, because again, this provides the context for the recovery. So the county-wide response has been led by the Hertfordshire Local Resilience Forum. As it says there, over 60 organisations involved in that across the public sector. Uh, a huge number of volunteers um, came forward, which has been absolutely fantastic. There's links into central government. So um, MHCLG representatives have been on the calls that we've had, um, the weekly calls that we've had at, at chief exec level and also um, with the uh, coordinating groups. They've, they've been in those calls as well. There is a county-wide strategic recovery plan um, where David uh, previously and now me going forward will be our, have been our representative. There's various different cells that sit under that as part of or as part of that uh, response. For example, there's the volunteer and people assistance cell, but there's a communication cell um, tactical cell, there's um, community reassurance cell, there, there's any number of different um, following, any number of different cells essentially following the um, emergency planning structures for how to respond to any uh, emergency type situation. Our local response has been led by myself and David uh, and will continue to be going forward and part of that county-wide approach and also through the LGA and other 
local government representative organisations. We've been petitioning government for additional funding, ensuring that when the government has asked for the regular updates on our financial position, those are then shared with the LGA, uh, DCN, whoever else is, is asking for them so that they can build up a comprehensive picture to help uh, put forward the case that local government needs additional support in order to respond to what we're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I touch now on uh, the council's response. So we were able to have um, virtually everyone working at home uh, in a matter of days. Our pre-pandemic average for number of home workers is 80 uh, on any given day. That average is currently at around 250 and actually maxed out one day at 275 people all working from home. We currently have three or four people in the office um, just doing functions like post, which uh, where physical post is still coming in, um, needs to be scanned and, and sent to uh, whoever is working at home. We have been able to utilize um, the big investment that's been made previously in order to enable home working. We have been able to take some of the PCs out of the office, out of the DCO, provide them to people. Um, we've got um, some departments working at home for the first time ever. So Careline, for example, historically has always been office based, has never had a home working presence, um, nor has the customer service centre. Well, both of those are now operating completely from home. Um, supported by the, the staff in those departments working from home. And that response and the flexibility that the staff have given us has been simply fantastic and a huge credit to them. We've, uh, as mentioned there, we've developed paperless operations, for example, planning, who have always heavily relied on, uh, in particular, um, printed copies of the plans for planning applications. Well, they're now working entirely paperless. And it's some of these things that perhaps we can um, take as positives from coming out of a, a really uh, quite horrible situation for everyone in terms of positive ways that we can change the way we work going forward to allow greater flexibility. Um, as members will all be aware, um, we have enabled video conferencing and live streaming of council meetings. Whilst uh, video conferencing was on the IT work programme, that was for later in the year, that all had to be brought forward and essentially introduced overnight. Um, and uh, the IT team has done a fantastic job doing that. One of the other teams that's been doing wonderful work, uh, and, and again, credit to them, has been our rev revenue and benefits teams. Um, there has been a 10% increase in our benefit caseload. They have, uh, as you see there, paid out business grants. That's under the um, two government schemes, business grants totaling 20, just over 25 million pounds. Additionally, over 200 discretionary business grants, totaling 1.3 million, um, all, all, have done, all, all of which done um, putting into, new system, into place new systems at very short notice uh, and getting that money out to the businesses as quickly as we could so that they were able to uh, try to maintain their own economic viability. The housing, the rough sleepers within 24 hours of being asked to get everyone off the streets was um, a, a huge piece of work uh, and again great credit to our housing team and to uh, the partners we work with in the um, homelessness sector. Additionally we've made 1500 welfare calls to residents that was um, in relation to those residents who potentially had been identified as needing to be shielded uh, but who had not um, contacted uh, the NHS or the County Council. We made those calls to just chase, chase up, just to check that they were all right, to see whether they needed additional support or not. Um, through the County Council, um, we received a thousand food parcels that we provided to four different local organizations who then passed them on to those, um, within, uh, those in need within the community. Additionally, um, sent out more than 7,000 letters um, to the community to, um, again, following up to make sure that everyone was okay uh, and to let people know where to access help if they needed to. Something else we did um, early on was the leader of the council wrote to 
uh, every uh, household in the district to advise them as to how to access our services with the DCO having been closed. I should obviously say that um, I haven't listed everything that we've done, just sort of some of the, the um, larger higher profile items. So in terms of the recovery response, and I flag this as so far because um, clearly it is only just really starting the recovery response. So initially our focus has been on resuming the service delivery in the areas where uh, we'd had no option other than to uh, close the services. So the obvious ones being the ones we were touching on earlier, being the pools, the leisure centres, the parks, those, those sorts of things. Clearly we have to work with partners. So Stevenage Leisure in respect of the leisure centre, John O'Connor in terms of the grounds and the parks and the playgrounds. And um, we've been working with them uh, as they have developed their own recovery plans to make sure that they met our requirements. In, in particular, our environmental health team um, has been uh, putting in a huge effort advising all of our colleagues within the council on what they need to do for the reintroduction of services, but also advising our partners and also advising uh, the businesses and the communities. They, they've been doing a, a huge amount of work over recent weeks. We have got plans in place for re reopening the DCO when appropriate. I stress that uh, when appropriate. At the moment, the air conditioning is switched off in the building um, because there is currently conflicting advice as to what impact air conditioning systems have on the um, spread of the droplets in the air. So until we have a bit more clarity on that, the air conditioning needs to stay off. Um, and as people will appreciate, that doesn't make a particularly conducive working environment on hotter days. We have been monitoring the temperature in the building for those handful of people who have been in, um, and so far it's been okay, but um, that's only with a very limited number in. As soon as you get more people in, uh, more electronic devices switched on and emitting heat, um, obviously those temperatures could, could rise if we aren't able to use the air conditioning. We have plans in place for how to reopen the CSC um, as and when required. At the moment though, services are, uh, as I said, all being able to be delivered. Uh, people are able to contact us um, and uh, we haven't yet had any complaints that I'm aware of in terms of people being unable to access those services. Clearly, um, at some point, we will reopen the building. Um, initially, it's likely to mean a phased return. It's likely to mean limited numbers of staff. We'll have to think carefully around uh, the timing of when people come and go from the building. Uh, the pinch points essentially are, if I put it the other way, once people are sat at the desks, if we sort of essentially rope off every other desk, then there is sufficient uh, space there for social distancing. The issues are when people need to go to the toilet and you can only really have one person in uh, each set of toilets at any one time if you're maintaining distance. Um, it's how to get people in and out of the building where our entranceways and the stairs in particular don't necessarily allow for proper social distancing. We've currently got the lifts um, turned off on the basis that again, um, difficulty in terms of maintaining the uh, constant cleaning that would be needed because of potential transmission on the surfaces, but also you can't social distance within the lift. Um, and so for anyone that does need the lift to access high, um, the upper floors, that's obviously an issue. So there's all these sorts of considerations. Um, as I said, we have developed the plans. It will be a phased return when uh, we believe it is the right time to do so. A bit more in a moment on, on how we'll make those decisions. Uh, and obviously we will keep uh, councillors fully informed as to uh, what we're doing in that respect. And obviously um, also keep the community informed in terms of how to uh, be in contact with us. Um, as members will be aware and was referenced earlier during the meeting, um, the North Hearts Museum reopened on the 4th of July. So clearly they had a recovery plan in place, which they have executed. Uh, with social distancing and limiting it to tours at the moment. We worked very closely with Hitchin Market to enable them to reopen on the 2nd of June, again with appropriate measures in place. And again, that was one where environmental health were incredibly helpful um, in, in terms of providing that advice and support. We have worked with authorities across the county to develop those approaches. We've worked with the county to reopen the high streets. 
Um, they've obviously taken the lead on that, given that is one of their areas of responsibility, which I know Ian Fullstone has been in um, a lot of contact with them on in respect of that. Um, and Ian is in this meeting today, if there's any particular questions, um, as he's been, um, again, uh, very supportive in terms of developing this, um, this recovery response. Uh, Martin has already mentioned the local outbreak plan, which has been published, so members hopefully have had an opportunity to see that. Uh, but again, as part of the recovery, it's the point I made about it may not be a smooth curve, and therefore we need to have the outbreak plans in place as to how we will manage um, any response to uh, an uptick in uh, infections in our local area. So that has to form part of the recovery. We need to essentially be ready to go backwards um, to go forwards if we need to. So um, it's been agreed that we are going to set up a recovery project board. Um, I believe the um, agreed approach is that there will be two members from uh, all three political parties, so a total of six members on that board, uh, although uh, the leader of the council can confirm that's the case if I've um, misremembered. Uh, additionally, um, some of the senior leadership team who have been part of our recovery planning so far will also be on that. Uh, and setting up that board to uh, do all of those things listed there in terms of having that oversight, um, monitoring the delivery of, of the recovery, um, providing the guidance uh, and direction and political input, um, ensuring that we manage it appropriately, making sure there's appropriate risk management in place uh, and consideration of ongoing risks, which is obviously, whilst the pandemic is still um, circulating is still out there uh, and until there is a widespread vaccine that works uh, there is going to have to be risk mitigation and um, sort of appropriate steps in place um, in order to in, in all of our uh, everyday lives uh, so the council's operations are obviously not unique to that so um, making appropriate use of our resources making sure we're working effectively with others as required um, uh, providing that member engagement um, and making sure that we engage the members properly to help get these messages out to the public as, as required. Um, and obviously to input into uh, future updates to other committees as required. So uh, final slide is trying to look a bit more at the positive and look at the opportunities. So it's already been touched on in the leader's remarks earlier uh, and also in some of my comments that um, we have been working differently and we have been delivering our services differently. And that potentially creates an opportunity to look at how we work going forward and whether there are better or more efficient ways of doing things. Clearly taking on board the point that was made earlier, we have to be mindful that we still need to be accessible to all of our communities um, with all of their sort of differing uh, needs in terms of being able to access us but where we can develop alternative solutions that are, to the, um, that are able to improve, uh, are able to uh, provide greater flexibility, greater access for our customers, then, then certainly we should look at that. Um, we, I think, potentially need to recognize that some of our community groups are going to be struggling at the moment and we'll have big question marks over them. Uh, clearly, there may be a limit to what we can do financially to support them, given the budgetary pressures on ourselves. And, um, but it, are there other ways that we can support them and are there ways that we can work with them? I think one of the really positive things that has come out of this, is, and we were on a call with the Heritage Foundation last week, um, where this came up, the, the way that people have rallied together, the way that different uh, organizations have worked together and worked closely in a way that they haven't done before, um, the way we've worked with the community groups, there's great opportunities there to build on that going forward and really cement those relationships and work together in other areas. We've shown we can work together and we've, we've worked together at the drop of a hat. Well, if we can take a more considered and a more planned approach to, to those sorts of work, um, there, there may be great things that we can achieve together. One, uh, the fourth bullet point there, 
I think one of the things that reflecting on, on what has happened uh, in terms of the government approach to funding, whilst there has been the um, general unring fence to funding that has come out to all authorities, there has also been pots of money that you could bid against. Um, but essentially you need to have oven ready or shovel ready projects is typically how they're described. Um, so things that are ready to go because the turnaround times are such for, you sometimes only get two, three, four weeks notice for um, these, these uh, funding opportunities. And so we perhaps need to think about how we can more proactively uh, target some of that uh, available funding, um, albeit recognizing that in the past, uh, North Hearts as a affluent area um, has not been at the forefront of the queue for that funding. I think um, we need to recognize that then there will be areas of opportunity and there will be commercial growth at some point. Clearly, we know the economy has contracted. I think I was reading earlier by approximately 20% as a result of the pandemic. Um, may have got that figure wrong, but I think that was the headline figure. So um, that potentially may open up opportunities if we are confident we're able to invest essentially at the bottom of the market and then benefit from um, the, the growth that uh, will come as the economy returns. However, there is clearly risk attached to that approach. And so we would very carefully, we would need to very carefully balance out um, the risk and reward in, in respect of that. Um, I think one of the, the so next point down there in terms of um, looking at our fees and our charges and trying to be more of an enabling authority uh, and, and not unnecessarily putting bureaucracy in people's way, I think it is quite key. Um, we've been able to do things quicker than we've ever done them before, and, and we aren't, aren't alone in that. Well, why can't that be one of the lessons we learn going forward in terms of how we work? In terms of those fees and charges, I think there is uh, something there we need to think about. We could obviously endlessly pursue people for fees and charges if, if they are in arrears, but if that means we end up pushing organizations uh, into insolvency, we will never get our money back and potentially uh, the community may um, suffer economically as, as a result if, if businesses close, uh, if employees are laid off. So there's something there to think about. Clearly though, we do have to have one eye on our finances. And just whilst I'm touching on the finances, there is a report going to FAR and Cabinet next week we are currently estimating that the income losses and additional spend as a result of the pandemic are currently around 4.7 million pounds. Uh, so, so far we have received 1.4 million pounds of non-ring fenced grant. Uh, and this was the point the leader was making earlier about um, the government providing the money that they promised to us. So as you can see, currently a significant shortfall the most recent announcement from a couple of weeks ago, which um, provided uh, some reassurance around um, replacing lost income, uh, albeit uh, not all of it, but some of it, um, and sort of three quarters of it, essentially. Uh, we are still waiting for the detail of that, so we don't know what is in scope or what is outside of scope. So our current estimate is um, that most recent announcement potentially could give us a further two million pounds or so, that would still leave us with a funding gap of 1.3 million pounds from reserves, um, to be met from reserves. So that's obviously quite a significant sum of money. Uh, we are fortunate that historically uh, we have built up our reserves. They were built up in order to help us to smooth out any further cuts in government funding going forward obviously weren't necessarily expecting to need to spend them as a result of the pandemic, but we have got reserves that we could uh, use for that shortfall. However, that money can only be spent once and does mean it's then not available for um, that smoothing out future funding cuts as and when we need it. So medium term impact, the biggest concern at the moment is potentially what the pandemic has done to our council tax base. 
So our normal working assumption is that we have a net 1% increase in council tax base um, per year. That's um, after taking into account additional costs. However, with um, the greater number of people in the district suffering from economic hardship and therefore sadly having to apply for things like our council tax reduction scheme, um, probably we'll see a delay in build uh, new build housing growth. Um, we're potentially now needing to, uh, we're, we're now modeling on having zero growth on our council tax base. Potentially, if it gets worse, uh, it, could, it could even shrink as well. And that adds almost pounds to the savings target over five years. So um, as I mentioned, if, if, if you are interested in, in looking at some of the detail behind that, um, then, um, as I said, there'll be a report going to fire and cabinet next week uh, to explain a bit more of that. So getting back to this slide and moving away from the finances, um, one of the things we need to do in terms of the building back better is um, getting people back into the towns and establishing uh, confidence in the uh, steps that have been taken, in the things that the county council have done, in the things that the bids are done, uh, are doing, sorry, and, and have done and are doing. Um, and um, need to think about where we as a council can help with that. That might involve reimagining the high street. Um, we know that uh, there will be businesses that fail, unfortunately, that may leave uh, empty premises. Can we, um, through planning, through economic development, through other departments, uh, identify what are uh, essentially known as meanwhile uses? So for those that are familiar with the phrase, um, essentially that's the like that's sort of things like um, pop-ups or other temporary uses that you put in to a unit whilst it is empty before it is then permanently let to the next tenant. Um, and then a uh, final point there about rethinking economic growth um, and recognizing, as it says there, that business as usual will be different for everyone. Um, and so that is going to make it complicated. So I think I've probably said enough. Uh, I'm in desperate need of a quick uh, drink. So if I stop sharing the screen, um, as I mentioned, Ian Fullstone is also on the call who um, helped prepare those. So thank you, Ian. Um, and potentially he can help answer questions and clearly the leader may be able to as well. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Anthony. Um, I have just put a little note, if anybody um, needs a comfort break. We'll just take, a, uh, we'll do Anthony's questions and bits and pieces so Anthony can get away at the end of this. And then we'll take a little comfort break after that for five minutes or so to allow people to get drinks and that. Uh, I've got two hands up so far, so I'll take those in a moment. Just a quick comment from me. Uh, I suppose I ought to declare a sort of interest in some of the stuff in this, although as we haven't got any decisions to make, it's it's not a prejudicial one. Uh, but my wife works for the custom in the customer service centre, which is currently in my spare bedroom, or a good proportion of it. Um, so I, I've I've got a bit of an interest in that, and I, I'm been in receipt of some business grants, just so people are aware of that one as well. Um, partly with the reimagining a high street thing as well, which I will come to in a moment. I think one thing that didn't sort of come out in summary there, Anthony, was one of the big um, things is the environmental impact of all what's happened here with people not traveling, uh, working from home, that the, the potential environmental benefits of what's happened is quite enormous. Uh, they are obviously the uh, downsides of it, i.e. Um, the bigger use of disposable plastics and that and disposable stuff coming back because you, particularly in restaurants and that has sort of self-defeated itself on that. Um, and one thing as well is, is the amount of packaging that we seem to be using. Um, you mentioned earlier about the um, recycling rates. Um, my recycling bin's full of cardboard from Amazon and other online sources at the moment. Um, much of which I have, I've reused as much as possible, but there is still an awful lot of stuff to go. Um, and I will make another point on that in a moment, but if I'll take Sam first and then Terry, so Sam. Thanks, David. I mean, that follows on quite nicely from what I was, I was gonna say. You mentioned sort of 
the working from home and the, the conversion of part of your house into a, a sort of makeshift customer service center. Uh, it's a question, I guess, for the, the deputy chief executive soon to have a job change, title change. But um, are there any sort of indications or any information on the efficiency of the council's staff working from home versus working in the offices? The reason I ask this is because in my experience of working in various different sectors, that quite often when you find people working from home, they actually prefer it. They put, actually put in more hours, do a better job, and it saves the company money overall. So actually, should we be exploring not going back to the old normal and working out a way with the staff that could save us money, improve their output, and make them a happier, make NHDC a happier place for everybody, a more effective place, and we can save a bunch of money for the taxpayer. Is that something we could we can be looking at? Um, Chair, if I can, and I'll also I'll answer that point and also pick up on the climate point as well. Um, so we have um, already identified the potential uh, opportunities there, and that is absolutely part of it. We will be sending a staff survey out um, later this month to all staff. And the focus of that will be on essentially their experience of working at home during the pandemic. And is it going to make them more likely um, or less likely to work from home more in the future? What that might look like. Um, if we if we look at it in terms of those numbers, I said um, previously, the average was 80 people working at home. Well, the floor plate um, in for, of each floor is approximately 35 desks. Well, if we're able to get that average figure up to even if it's just, say, 120 people working at home um, on uh, as an average, that would free up a floor, which could then be either let out or used for a community use or some other use. So there, there are absolutely uh, potential opportunities there that uh, we will certainly be looking at, obviously, in conjunction with the staff. Our approach to home working all along has been one of working with the staff rather than imposing anything on them. And I think what we do need to recognize is that whilst some staff have absolutely benefited from working at home and appreciate that flexibility and perhaps have seen the benefits in a way that they didn't before, we also need to recognize that for some people it doesn't work. And so um, we've been doing welfare calls to all staff, our HR team has been doing that. Uh, and making sure that those that uh, are having more difficulty with it know how to access the support that is out there for them. Um, and clearly those staff who have been struggling will be the first ones to go back into the office, if at all possible. So um, ab absolutely, um, absolutely opportunities there. In terms of the, excuse me, the specific question around productivity, um, we haven't got any specific data to back it up, but certainly anecdotally, we believe that people are being uh, more productive. Um, we have taken the approach as an organisation to be as pragmatic and as flexible as possible because we recognise that a number of our staff have, um, say, children at home in particular, and until nurseries and schools reopen, some people are having to really juggle um, working uh, whilst also having that caring responsibility. So if that means they do sort of less hours during normal office hours and do a couple of hours in the evening, then we've been as flexible as we possibly can be. And basically have, the message has been do what you can when you can. Uh, and I think that's gone down really well with staff. Um, but as I said, the, we will be asking those questions during the staff survey. Obviously we'll be interested in seeing what those responses are uh, and seeing what that may provide by way of opportunities going forward. Um, on, the, on the climate point, uh, yes, you're quite right. It wasn't on the slides and, and perhaps should have been. As Martin, uh, the leader, mentioned earlier, we have the um, Climate Change Implementation Group is meeting on Thursday morning. And one of the agenda items and the first substantive item on the agenda is uh, what opportunities are there as a result of um, the pandemic to um, look at the potential benefits from a climate point of view. You only have to look at those working at home numbers to appreciate that the climate, the, the carbon footprint of the organization has been vastly reduced during this period, simply from people not driving to and from the office um, and also from people not doing site visits. So um, planners, for example, at one point were having to 
um, essentially you, I think I'm right, Ian will correct me if I'm wrong, was sort of using um, Google Maps and things like that to do virtual site visits uh, whilst we're in the most uh, restrictive period of lockdown. Well, are, are there opportunities to change how we work so that we can reduce that carbon footprint? And clearly one of the ways to do that will be having more people working at home going forward. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, just before I go to Terry, if anybody wants to jump up and put their lights on, because I know a couple of you are disappearing into the darkness, it's quite happy for you to disappear out of camera view long enough to do that. Okay, Terry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, thank you, Anthony, for your presentation there. A few questions, a few comments. Uh, first of all, um, I'll go through the questions and you can perhaps answer them. The number of rough sleepers that we had to very efficiently, very effectively and very quickly accommodate. Give me some feel for that number, please. Also, please, um, I know it will come out in the far probably, is the difference between loss of income as opposed to COVID costs. Um, some local authorities who have perhaps lost a lot of income through parking or through uh, airports or whatever, big difference between loss of income and the cost of COVID um, the, should we say that's been spent by those local authorities? Whilst it's all COVID related, there are, certainly the government is differentiating between those two numbers when it comes to compensation. So um, that I'll look up when FAR comes out and see. Um, can, uh, perhaps Ian can perhaps answer this around tables and chairs in Kirtledge in town centres. Um, I think there's a certainly a change in the law, which is currently, I think, sitting with the House of Lords. Which, reading the House of Lords, which is making life a lot more flexible. But I think the direction that's been coming down from above is, let's do it now anyway, as far as giving some flexibility around to, to um, cafes, bars that can open up with their chairs and tables outside to maintain uh, social distancing. So perhaps uh, Ian can answer that one. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, shovel-ready projects, um, perhaps we could, um, come back to a subject I mentioned earlier, it might still be there, Churchgate, as a, uh, and perhaps the Letchworth uh, Medical Town in the town centre might be, I don't know where they stand today, but certainly they were um, in two years ago, uh, certainly, um, I won't say travel ready, but certainly more ready than they were 20 years ago, um, I think if I'm Martin. Um, and I'll just mention on waste if I can, some area which I know a little bit about is, we have seen increase in waste household waste and we've seen an increase in household recycling as well because people are at home and therefore they're not taking if you like consuming their lunch in their office or in their factory or wherever they work they're having it at home and therefore we're seeing an increase in those sorts of things coming through to county council for us to dispose of so um that's something which of course may well happen in the future um Anthony if we start having more people working from home we could see that continuing an increase in in uh, household waste uh, that needs collecting and disposing of. So, number of rough sleepers, um, there's one question. What are we doing about chairs and tables? And uh, I'll leave you to answer those two. Thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll ask Ian Fullstone to pick up the rough sleepers number um, when, when, when he answers on the other point. In terms of the split between income and costs, um, I, I'll ask Ian Cooper to make sure he covers that when it comes to FAR, because I don't want to give an answer tonight that's misleading. I, I think I know what it is, but as I said, I don't want to mislead you. In relation to waste, um, completely agree in terms of, um, particularly if you look at the nature of the district, we have a lot of people that work in London. Well, they may be suddenly finding that actually, if either their organisation wants more people to work at home, or they've suddenly seen the light that, um, commuting into London on a sweaty commuter train for however many hours a week isn't the best way to spend their life. They may choose to work at home more than they have done in the past. Um, and, and so absolutely we'll be monitoring the waste levels going forward. But certainly if, if working practices generally change, then there, there could be changes there that we do see. Um, you mentioned the development opportunities and town centres. Uh, one thing to flag in the um, growth board prospectus that we're working on uh, for potential submission to government uh, across the county. Um, our town centres are, are earmarked as um, part of the town centres work stream. So clearly we need to see what comes out of the conversations with government, 
but hoping that there may be opportunities through that. Um, but obviously we'll need to watch this space. So if I could hand to, over to Ian to update on the, uh, where, we're, where we are with the change of law and um, also the rough sleepers. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Anthony. Good evening, everyone. Um, at the end of January, we had 93 in temp temporary accommodation. That equates over the lockdown period to somewhere between 10 and 15 more clients than we would normally see. Um, I think what's also important to recognise is that we did have a night shelter and as part of the government's drive for rough sleepers, night shelters were closed. That's currently in Hitchin. We probably had between 16 and 17 there in about four or five rooms. So clearly we had to, to move some of those to a hotel that we, we procured. So I think I would suggest that we're probably bouncing, as I said, between 10 and 15 additional customers. Some of those would be sofa surfing and clearly taking advantage of the government drive to, to house them. It, it's, it's an ideal opportunity. And there's also um, others that are the true rough sleepers that we've housed as well. So does that answer your question, Councillor Han? Thank you. Okay, and with regard to tables and chairs, yes, um, we, we had hopes a couple of weeks ago. The housing and planning bill went through the House of Commons in a day and there was talk that it would go through the House of Lords in a day. I think the House of Lords is on its second reading at the minute. We understand that they have some concerns and it may well go back to the House of Commons again. Um, in the meantime, um, under the current housing and planning bill, it's districts and boroughs that will grant the consent for tables and chairs. Uh, we're working clearly where it's on the highway with county council colleagues because we'll need to ensure that the road, the road is closed and that we'll also need to ensure that social distancing is maintained. Um, there's some areas of concern in the bill that we've got. It talks about being adjacent to the premise. So if you were looking at, for example, a market square or something like that, it may not strictly meet the criteria of the bill as it's currently written. So what we're doing, I had a meeting with county colleagues this morning. We've come up with a way whereby if people do wish to put tables and chairs on the highway, currently it's the current process through the county council who will discuss it with, with us. So I think until the bill becomes an act, as a district council, we are unable to grant approval for it. Okay, I have to say thank you for that. The county are quite prepared to be quite flexible around these things because we realise that it could have an impact on, on the ability for cafes in particular to draw in customers. So, so uh, hopefully we're showing that flexibility when you have communication with them. I do know that Councillor Hunt, that the County Council has reduced its fee for that down to the fee in the bill. So it is taking a proactive stance on that. I think it's £100, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Ian. I've, a couple of questions Terry asked were similar to the ones I was going to ask you as well, which was about the street licence and pavement licence and everything. Uh, because I, I saw our licensing team when they went out, when all the pubs and that opened last Saturday. Um, I, did, they did, I must admit, they did an excellent job. They were out first thing in the morning. They did all the town centres at least once, uh, and they came back for a couple. Um, and I know they did have words with one or two people who were uh, businesses, which, how shall we say, taking a little bit of advantage of the fact that of... Um, um, extending their premises slightly to cover a whole street in one case. Um, so but they, they were very proactive on that. And they were very, um, um, how shall I put it, subtle in the way that they did it. They weren't, weren't over heavy uh, and they were very subtle in the way they did it. And so I must compliment that, the team on, on Steve Cobb and that lot on what they did on that. That was, that was very good. Um, if I may, Chair, just come back on that for me. I know colleagues in environmental health were also out purely on a guidance, just giving kind of basic food hygiene and health advice as well. But with regard um, tables and chairs on the high street, with the DFT money the county council's got, we are kind of exploring what's known as the um, the park parklet style. So this is, if you like, temporary decking put within parking bays that can then either have planters, tables and chairs, seating, dependent upon the environment. I mean, we're in uh, discussion. Clearly, it's got to be led by either the parish council or the town council or the bid, who, who whoever wishes it. 
um, as officers. Um, we've worked and put the bids in the county council together in the town councils in the tranche, what they call the tranche one locations, which is Hitchin Town Centre, Royston Town Centre and Nebworth Town Centre. Um, in discussions with both Hitchin and Royston, it's a pedestrianisation opportunity that they're seeing there through the bids. And Nebworth, we kind of, as officers, asked the county to kind of discuss with first. I know there's concerns with the um, speed of the London Road and what have you. But it's, again, it's an opportunity. The money's there. Unfortunately, as you'll see, there's a theme tonight in that as soon as the county council got the letter of the amount of money, that you then have four weeks to par partially Im implement the scheme and eight weeks to completely do it. Otherwise, you have to give the cash back. So, you know, it is one of these things where we are moving really fast and conscious that communication may not be the best at all times, but we are working and trying to kind of give what we believe to be the first opportunities to where we think it should be and organising those meetings. Clearly, if it's not appropriate, we'll move on to, to the next one from there. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Ian. That's, that's good information. Thank you for that. Uh, right, very last one, and then we're going to take a short conference break. Claire. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of points. Um, the experience out in the rural areas where a lot of our pubs and that have been doing takeaway um, beer to those that turn up on the doorstep and then loiter around outside has been in you know, a lot of litter um, and mess and stuff. I did notice when I walked, when I went through Hitchin, a lot of people congregating on Wimble Hill and an immense amount of rubbish that just, you know, yeah, all, all credit to environmental health. You have to, you know, or, um, rather the cleansing people and you have to come out and actually empty those bins first thing in the morning and start trying to clear up. Um, but what, one question for me is, are, do we actually have sort of sufficient bins around in the district now to actually deal with the increase of everybody trying to, um, do uh, socialising on the outside uh, more in a, what I call a random social way. And also when I've been walking around the town, which I have ventured out now, um, I have to say having the, losing a lot of the parking base so that you know there's more space if you're going down, um, I think Sun Street, I was and at that it was you know very clearly noticeable but obviously some some of the bays around the, the market square were the disabled bays that have gone and I wondered again there's an impact there to our most disadvantaged residents if they do want to venture out of where them where their the ability is to park and if we are going to be looking at having more um, use of the roads I mean yes I think if we you know something along the lines of closing the the town centres at sort of five o'clock so that the businesses have an opportunity to put tables and chairs out so people could actually, you know, um, have, because a lot of the restaurants, I can't see how they could be viable at the moment um, with the practices that need to be put in place. But if they could, if they could have more of their tables outside, it, and certainly if we get, you know, the good weather returning, it gives us an opportunity to actually, put, you know, to provide those services back again and to build confidence in the town to get people back into the town so that we do, you know, get boost the economy locally. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. If I could perhaps uh, answer the, the first point that was raised and then perhaps hand over to Ian to pick up the parking point. Um, in relation to those pubs that are sort of doing takeaway service, our licensing team, our environmental health team have been keeping an eye on things. They've been going out as appropriate. I know of um, one example in the district, not in your patch, Councillor Strong, but, but elsewhere where it's been exactly that situation you've described where the customers who have come along as um, to sort of take take that takeaway service, but then have essentially congregated outside of the licensed premises. And once they are off the licensed premises, from the council's point of view, there is nothing that we can do from an enforcement uh, side of things, and it becomes a police issue, uh, particularly if it means um, having to enforce any uh, coronavirus. Um, regulations in terms of the social distancing and social gatherings, those sorts of things. That's a police matter to enforce. And that obviously gets quite tricky. Um, in relation to the sort of the waste that that generates. Um, yes, we're, we're clearly having to monitor the waste levels. Yes, they've gone up. But I think the message that we would uh, I think we have been putting out but the, the thing we would ask all of our community is if the bins are full, take the waste home with you uh, and, and sort of put it in your bins at home. And I think um, it's one of those 
points where, yes, we clearly have that responsibility and we have that service and we do deliver that. But equally, if members of our community are responsible uh, and do the right thing, then it creates less of a problem for us. Um, so if Just I can hand back, over to Ian. Really clearly they don't because the bins around the bins is a sea of uh, hold on, I'll just keep it to the point a little bit um a lot of it is down to individuals responsibility um we can't as a district council and if we you can't legislate for everybody's behavior people have to take some sort of responsibility but in if you could just pick up on the parking point and of course one thing on there of of uh, I, I could probably help with as well is that uh, about the disabled bays, uh, a blue badge holder can park anywhere they want basically as long as it's not dangerous. So the lack of a blue badge bay isn't necessarily a disadvantage. But Ian, if you want to pick up on the rest of that. I think, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what Councillor Strong is saying. And at the moment we're balancing, if you like, four priorities. We're, we're balancing a blue, blue badge parking. We're balancing loading and unloading. We're balancing social distancing. And we're trying to balance the tables and chairs to ensure that the businesses thrive. And it is a fine balance. And I think, you know, I don't think I'm talking out of turn where both kind of in discussions with county colleagues, we do get it wrong. And it's it's... With, that's the beauty on Anthony's one of his earlier slides where we're in the interim we're coming to the interim stage where anything we put in is a temporary measure so that you know we put it in with what we think is right if it's not right then we can change it and with the parklets and that it is just temporary we can move them we can change them it's just an opportunity to try something and see if it works rather than doing a permanent feature but you're quite right a blue badge holder can park Unless there's the double ticks on the curb, they can park anywhere so long as it's safe. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for that. OK, we'll take a short break now. Uh, it's 9.33. If we can be back here by at the very, very latest 9.40, please. Thank you.
when you're ready, Chair, you can call everybody back to the uh, okay. meeting. Yep, I'm, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay, everybody, if we can all switch cameras, etc., etc., on, and we'll start again. I got everybody. Right, okay, I've got all the members present that were present, I think. Okay, uh, let's move on then, resume the meeting. Uh, and just thank you to Anthony uh, and Ian there for the, the, the last uh, item. Um, what I'm going to do, because we're getting a bit tight on time and various other things, item 12 on the agenda is the annual report of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which asks for comments. Um, to, for consideration by council, next council. Uh, as that's some time away, I'll, I'll leave that item and ask for written comments on that one, if everybody's happy with that one. Um, put any written comments in, not that one, and we'll go. So we'll leave that one as it is, ask for written comments. We'll go to the next item, item 11, take that one, and then we'll close the meeting for the evening, if everybody's happy with that. Okay. Um, so go to item 11, full year update, comments, complaints, uh, comments, compliments and complaints. Joe, if you're there, please. Evening, Joe. It's, yep. it's, actually, um, it's actually me to introduce that uh, right. under the new arrangement that, uh, and uh, I, I'm glad Joe has, um, uh, has shown herself because we can also, as a committee, congratulate her because in October, of course, she becomes the service director for customers. Thank you. So Thank you. Um, that, that's that's good to uh, to know, and congratulations to her. Now, um, I have ah, my um, computer is doing nasties on me at the moment, and uh, I have some things to to tell you. And when I look at my laptop as well on this item. Um, uh, this is, of course, the annual update for the three Cs covering the period from uh, as, as a year up to the 31st of March 2020. And uh, of course, the policy, the three Cs policy re reviewed and refreshed last year, the policy sets out the definition of a comment, compliment and complaint. Um, we capture feedback both directly at the council and via our contractors who are providing key services on our behalf. Uh, we have in the last year seen a reduction in the number of three Cs received in comparison to the preceding year, which had a significant increase at that time following changes in waste and recycling, and which I referred to in, in my um, uh, presentation earlier in the meeting. Uh, we know that after such a change, it takes some time to return to a usual level. Uh, complaints decreased significantly from 1,947 in the previous year to 746 in, in 1920. 80% of those complaints relate to services delivered by our key contractors, uh, Waste and Recycling 340 and Leisure Centres 273. It is worth noting that 74% of the 543 compliments received relate to the same services, that is waste and recycling and the leisure centres. Uh, and now it's uh, important that we, um, sorry, that we continue to listen to and learn from the feedback from our customers. And there are some examples of that highlighted in the report, such as the changes to the Garden Waste subscription service this year to improve the sign up experience for customers and the example at 3.7 regarding the squash court lights at the leisure centre, North Arts Leisure Centre. There were 16 stage complaints and 10 escalated to the local government ombudsman, of which one was upheld related to private sector housing. And you can see that in 3.13. Other points to note from the dashboard, Appendix A, that whilst um, complaint numbers have not yet returned to a level similar before the service change, our response times have improved with 74% resolved within 10 days. It's also worth noting the high number of interactions that take place with our customers and that while we are continuing looking to improve, the percentage resulting to, for a form of complaint is very low. And um, 
looking at the relevant um, point on that, um, it is worth noting that um, uh, when we look at um, NHDC, it does look as though at 0.1%, it's somewhat higher than with um, our contractors, but of course that's 0.1% of people who actually um, directly contact the, the, the council rather than the, all our residents, in which case again it would be a very, very low figure. Um, if I then chair go on to the social media report, which is in Appendix C, uh, we get most engagement through Facebook um, and we've been focusing on Facebook more recently. Engagement has gone up by 16,000, which is great. Uh, the beginning of the um, lockdown period makes for an interesting comparison between Facebook and Twitter. The most popular post, post across 2019-20 in terms of reach on Facebook came during the lockdown on Thursday 26 of March. The post announcing the suspension of food and garden waste collections reached over 107,000 users, of which over 26k were actively engaged, um, liked, shared, etc. On Twitter, the equivalent post re received just under 7k users, of which over 1,045 were engaged, replied, retweeted, etc. In terms of numbers, it seems clear that Facebook has to be viewed as the priority for communicating in a crisis. Engagement on Twitter appears to be plateauing. Retweets, mentions and direct messages have all gone down in the last 12 months compared to 2018-19, although the summer of 2018 did see an abnormally high level of traffic due to the problems connected with the newer Urbasa Waste contract. Um, so that's the, the, the summary. I have to say in reflecting on questions that uh, Councillor Home raised earlier, actually complaints about the, uh, the suspension of the service were, were relatively low, I think. And in fact, our customers were extremely understanding about the reasons we have to do that. And I think that will be reflected when we look going forward. So um, that's a bit, that introduces the report. Um, and I'm struggling to come press the right button to see, see you all again. So happy to answer questions, although I think um, Joe is probably far more in a, in a position to answer any detailed questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, have you got anything to add, Joe? Sorry. Um, no, well, just the one thing that I would mention actually is around the um, contractor complaints and that um, whilst we haven't gone back to the level uh, prior to last year, we can see that um, complaints for Abasa are lower than they were uh, with the previous contractor. Um, and, you know, a lot of work was done in terms of taking feedback on board and making changes to um, both operational practices, but also the, the sign up process for the forthcoming uh, subscription to the Garden Waste Service. Thank, thank you, Joe. I, I had actually picked up on that one about Viola versus Abasa. Uh, interesting to note that despite the, you know, after those initial teething problems, the appears we did get the right contractor because they get in less complaints and appear to be doing a better job. So that seems to be a good one. I wonder if you could pick up on a point for me, please. Martin mentioned the bit on, which is on page 29, the percentage of interact react interactions resulting in a formal complaint. Martin made the point about ours, the, the NHDC one plea appears to be fairly high because it's those people who actually contact the district council, not the, the actual population. However, a BASA number of interactions is 7.1 million. Um, I just wonder if you could explain roughly how that's made up and does it follow the same sort of format is it is it is it people who actually use a particular service and have used it or, or how does that huge number come about so the 7.1 million is based on the number of collections that take place um so that the number of bins uh caddies etc that are emptied um whereas the nhdc figure is the number of inbound contacts that we receive um, it is only those that we can 
kind of count. So everything that comes into our customer service center, um, inbound telephone calls, emails, uh, face-to-face visits. But of course, um, as was mentioned earlier, there's an awful lot of other interactions that go on between officers and members of the public that aren't counted in those figures. And, and, and what's taken into account on the, the leisure centre ones is is because they are the little dude it's smiley face things now, don't they? Yeah. So the leisure centres is the number of visitors that they have in. Um, and that's obviously a very high in number as well. Um, I think I mentioned in the report that the leisure centres have all installed feedback machines. Um, I think it, 18 months ago, perhaps maybe slightly longer. And since then, they've seen a um, increase in feedback. It's completely self-service. So the customer decides on whether it's a comment or a compliment or a complaint. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a better system than they had before, which was very manual. And it also generates um, automatic notifications through to the managers and the duty managers in case there's something that needs their attention very quickly. Um, so yeah, that's how that's captured. Yeah, um, so, so those, those figures from the push button things are taken into account. They are. Okay, thank you for that. that that's helpful. It's just trying to see if I, we, we were comparing like for like, but it's actually, we, we're not effectively. There's different ways of analysing the data on each one. So yeah, okay, that's just what I was trying to get to is, is where we're using the same basis as to, for those percentages. But and that's subjective, isn't it? I think it's the best way to put it. It's difficult to do an exact like for like because of obviously the nature of the services. Yeah, yeah, it's just better to stick with the uh, breakdowns, I think. As, as yeah. uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, any questions from anybody? Anything further on that? No, thank you. Well, I think that one note report is just to note as far as I can see. Yep, that, that's an information note to just carry on with. Uh, so thank you for that, Joe. Sorry to keep you so long before you got your, your go. That's uh, OK, thank you. And thank you, Martin, as well, for your introduction on that one. Um, there is no other business, no other questions notified from members. As I said earlier, item 12, if you could just give me written feedback on that, please, and we'll make sure that's taken into account when we take it forward to council later in the, later, later in the year. It's got the month's time still. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for taking part. Thank you to those cabinet members who came and sat in on the meeting and some of the comments you put on the uh, thing, particularly Keith. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and good night and see you next time. Thank you.